Someone has said that faith is not belief in spite of evidence. It is an embracing of evidence and a love of the person, even God himself, who's been so gracious to provide the evidence. If we choose not to believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, it is not for lack of evidence. As we continue our way through Luke chapter 24, Jesus' appearances to his disciples were intended to give them and us who read Luke's gospel the evidence we need to trust and follow him as our living Lord and coming King. Do you believe he's alive today? Amen. The title of this morning's message from Luke 24, 36 to 49 is, You are Witnesses of the Resurrection. And the truth I want you to take home from this passage is very simply this. The reality of Jesus' resurrection comforts us so that we trust him and obey his commission to proclaim the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's a mouthful. But I hope by the time we're done, you'll see all of that from the text. The reality of Jesus' resurrection comforts us so that we trust him and obey his commission to proclaim the gospel in the power of his spirit. How does the reality of the resurrection do that in our lives? I want you to notice with me this morning the following five actions by which Jesus comforts us with the reality of his resurrection so that we might trust him and obey his commission to preach the gospel to the nations in the power of his spirit. First of all, see with me in verses 36 and 37, Jesus extends the peace of his presence to his fearful disciples. Jesus extends the peace of his presence to his fearful disciples. Up to this point, all 11 of the remaining disciples had not yet seen Jesus. He'd made an appearance to Peter, we're told, in just the verses that precede. Uh, Mary Magdalene and some of the women had seen Jesus. We know that the two fellows that had just come in from the road to Emmaus, they had seen Jesus. But the other 10 of the 12 disciples had not yet seen him. And Jesus comes to extend peace, even of his presence the peace of his presence to his fearful disciples. Verse 36, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. John's uh, record of this situation and this same occasion over in John chapter 20 verse 19 says this on the evening of that day the first day of the week and remember we're still on Easter Sunday it's evening now it's been a long day Jesus has been busy this day showing himself to his followers on the evening of that day the first day of the week the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews you wonder how they were doing, that's how they were doing. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Now there's a reason John says the doors were locked. Jesus, it says, came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. He didn't come through the door. Are y'all tracking? He just was in the room. He came. That's all John can say. Luke don't know how to describe it because they don't know how he did it. But he came and he was in the room. Now, here's what I can tell you. I'm not a smart man, but I can tell you this. If God can raise Jesus from the dead, then Jesus can appear in a room. If he made the world, if, if, if there's things we can't yet, yet understand about the created realm, and by the way, there is. Science can explain how a lot of things work, but there's a lot of questions that they cannot tell us why. You ever wondered why does your heart keep beating? The cardiologist can explain to you how it beats. 
the normal rhythms and, and, and what all's going on. But, but why? Why don't you die in your sleep? You know, we come real close to death at night. Our bodies shut way down. <laughs> Some of us feel that in the mornings more than others, right? I mean, it takes longer to get the motor running. But why don't we just stop breathing when we go to sleep? You see, if God can raise the dead, he, he can figure this out with Jesus, that he appears in the room. And what does he say? Peace be with you. Isn't it interesting? These are the same guys that had left him all by himself in the garden. They'd run away. Ah, Peter got kind of close. He kind of hung around, kind of trailed behind him and was there in that joke of a trial outside of Caiaphas' house. Caiaphas's house. But what did he do in the courtyard? Just what Jesus said he would do. Denied him three times. Jesus doesn't, the first time he sees all the boys again, he doesn't say, you know, I told you, you were going to all desert me. What kind of friends are you? He comes to his disciples, the ones who had forsaken him, and he says, Peace be with you. Not only does Jesus extend the peace of his presence, Jesus brings us peace with God. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 to 18, Paul tells us that he himself, speaking of Jesus, is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near, for through him... We both have access in one spirit to the Father. In the context, Paul's talking about the whole Jew and Gentile divide. In that day, there, were, there was the people of God, the Jews, and then there was everybody else, the Gentiles. And basically, God dealt through, through the nation of Israel. He dealt with them. They were his chosen people. But, 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 but here Paul is saying, in Christ, God's doing a new thing. He's taken down the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile. At the bottom line of what he's saying is there's no difference. No matter Jew, no matter Gentile, we all stand on level ground at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. He's come to save those who were near, that is Israel, as well as those who were far, that is Gentiles. He has come, and we only come to God the same way through faith in Jesus. And he himself is our peace, first with God. And then with one another. We have brothers and sisters this morning all around this world. Some of them don't look anything like us. And for some of us, that's a good thing. Praise the Lord, they don't. But, you know, for others of us, uh, you know, for, 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 for all of us, I mean, they don't speak the same language. We couldn't understand what they were saying if we, if we were to be in the same room with them. And yet, they are our brothers and sisters, and we will spend eternity with them. There is peace. There is, there is a peace in this world among believers, the world over, that the world will never know. Our unity in Christ. Because we all have peace with God through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus extends the peace of his presence even through the payment of his own life, death, and resurrection to his fearful disciples. But secondly, Jesus exhibits proof to his doubting disciples. This is a good place to ask. Are you ever fearful as a follower? You know, we're probably not ever in that situation where the disciples were. Man, they didn't know what was going on. They followed Jesus for three, three and a half years, and suddenly he's dead. And then there's talk he's alive. And then there's talk some women saw him walking around. They don't know what to think. They're fearful. And Jesus brings peace to them. But Jesus also exhibits proof here in verses 38 to 43 to his doubting disciples. So let me go ahead and ask you, do you ever doubt? You ever wonder about things that the Bible tells you to be true? We all do. Verse 38, and he said to them, Why are you troubled, and why did doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. 
touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took and ate it before them. Jesus exhibits proof to his doubting disciples. Jesus said, y'all are freaking out. Y'all are scared to death. Why are, why are all these doubts, and, and, and why is your heart so troubled? It's me. I'm here. I'm here just like I said I was going to be. Touch me. Here's my hands. Here's my feet that prove I was on that cross three days ago. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Now, if you're tracking along, if you're keeping up with the story, then you're probably wondering, so how does that work? I mean, he's got, he's got, a, he's got a body that they could touch. How did he not open the door? Well, once again, if God can raise the dead, he can do that. And yet, this is not some phantom body. It's just not some apparition. It's a, it's a, a physical, touchable, flesh and bones body. And so, he showed them his hands and his feet. They touched him. And then verse 41 is an interesting verse, but it, it no doubt describes where we would have been too. You know, we, we read this verse and we're, we're apt to give them a hard time. I mean, what's it going to take for y'all to believe? But, but listen, we'd have been the same way, right? And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, I'm not even sure what that means, but I think it's something like it was so good that it couldn't possibly be true in their minds. It was too good to be true. They just couldn't believe it. It's not that they didn't understand it and didn't comprehend the reality of that was before them. It was simply that in their joy and their marveling, they were still processing, we would say today. It was just too much for their senses. And look at how gracious the Lord is here. While they're in this rattled state, they're beginning to see and, 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 and accept the fact that he's risen from the dead and standing right there that they've just touched their living Savior. He takes it a step further for them. Have you something to eat? Let me just prove to you. In this day, there was a, a great fear of ghosts. And it was believed that the souls of people could walk around. And, and so this was, this is, he knew what they were struggling with. And so he says, let me, let me show you that I'm not a, a ghost. I can eat the same food you just ate for dinner time. And so he did. Just the grace, grace of our, our Lord, the kindness of our Lord. We sang about it to his disciples. Well, you know, that evening, somebody was missing. And I, so I got my numbers wrong earlier. I said he appeared to the 11. No, he appeared to the 10 because somebody was missing that night. Who was not there that night? Anybody know a little Bible trivia? Thomas. John chapter 20, verses 24 to 29, tell us about a what happens about eight days later. Now, Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I'll never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them Although the doors were locked, same deal, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And let me just stop right here and say this. The only right response to a resurrected Jesus is my Lord and my God. No other response to the living Savior will do. If he is alive, that is who he is. He deserves to be your God, and he deserves to be your Lord, your master. He deserves to call all the shots in all of our lives. Is he alive? My Lord and my God. Verse 29, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? You know what the answer to the Tom, for Thomas was at that point? Yep. 
And by the way, that was good enough for Thomas. It's good, good enough for the Lord. It, it was, but, but listen to what he says next. This is for you. This is for me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. How many of you have ever seen... Wait, wait a minute, Michael. That, you're ready. But How many of you have seen the risen Jesus? Anybody? Jesus wrote this for you and for me. The Bible tells us there were over 500 people at one time that did, plus all the other appearances we've been looking at. There were eyewitnesses. I've never seen him face to face. But I take the, the eyewitness testimony of a slew of people who did. And all of his apostles, all of his disciples, you, we've seen it. They disbelieved for a while. It's not that they made this up because they wanted a, a, a resurrected Savior. They couldn't even conceive of that. They denied that. They doubted the women. They even doubted Jesus face to face for a minute. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I think of passage in Peter where Peter says, even though we haven't seen him, we love him. Even though we haven't seen him, we're filled with a joy inexpressible. You see, that's what God does by his spirit in our hearts when we come to trust Christ, as he indwells us, even by the spirit of Jesus himself. Jesus exhibits proof to his doubting disciples. Again, faith is not without evidence. We believe in historical fact. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you understand? That's just as much a historical fact as the day you were born, as this day is on the calendar, as anything that will happen in your life ever. It's a historical fact. The grave is empty. There were eyewitnesses that saw him. Now, the world's been denying this and trying to explain it away. But once again, where's the body? You know where his body is? At the right hand of the Father, reigning over all things as King of kings and Lord of lords. Thirdly, Jesus explains prophecy about his death and resurrection in verses 44 to 46. Jesus explains prophecy about his death and resurrection. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. Jesus said, What you are experiencing right now it's exactly what I told you would happen. And it's exactly all of the stuff that the, that, the, that the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms said had to happen. So I told you, and I told you that the Old Testament tells you that what's gone on in the last three days is exactly what had to happen if there would ever be a Savior for this world. And then he opened their eyes to understand the scriptures. We don't know if he gave the disciples here the same lesson he gave those guys down there at the dinner table uh, and on the road at Emmaus. We don't know. But what we do know is that when it was all over, they understood from scripture. Suddenly they saw, in, and, and, be, and let's be clear on that, the scripture that we're, we're talking about is which testament of the Bible? The Old Testament. There wasn't a New Testament yet. So from the Old Testament, he explains to them how even all of the Old Testament points to Jesus. Last Sunday, we talked about how in every book of the Old Testament, Jesus is there. I'm not going to go through that again. Go back and listen to last week's message if you want to hear that. But certainly his lesson had to include verses like Genesis 3.15, where in the Garden of Eden, God says, I will put 
to the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. You reckon that's been true for all of human history? That, that Satan has been after humanity. The Bible tells us that in other places, doesn't it? But then God said this to the serpent who had tempted Adam and Eve. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That's called the Proto-Euangelion. And what that means is it's the first occurrence of the gospel in all the Bible. There's going to be enmity between your seed, Satan, and the seed of the woman. But his... How does it say it? He, the seed of the woman, shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his feet. He's going to crush you. He's going to stomp you down into the ground, Satan. Oh, you're going you're to bruise his heel, the crucifixion. Jesus is going to have to die, but in his dying, he's going to crush you, Satan. And that's exactly what happened. His explanation, no doubt, included Psalm 22, verse 1, and also verses 6 to 8. You know what Psalm 22, verse 1 says? You've heard it before, maybe not from Psalm 22, but from one of the Gospels. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Who said that? Jesus. Did you know he was quoting Psalm 22, 1 when he said it from the cross? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Verse 6, but, uh, but I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. He claimed to save others. Let him save himself. Surely his explanation included Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 6, where it says, Surely he, speaking of Messiah to come, has borne our griefs 800 years before he came and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us what? We already mentioned it this morning. Peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity, the sin of us all. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge, that is his knowledge of death, shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. He died between two what? Transgressors, thieves. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. 800 years before Jesus died on that cross for you, the Old Testament was pointing ahead and saying, he's coming and here's what he's going to do. And the Jews missed the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 all together. Jesus explains prophecy about his death and resurrection. The Old Testament is a Christian book. It is a Jesus book points to him. Fourthly, this morning, Jesus explains prophecy, listen to this, about the preaching of the gospel to the nations by his followers. Jesus explains prophecy about the preaching of the gospel to the nations by his followers. Verses 45 to 47, rereading 45 and 46, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And what you should do here is go back and pick up four words out of verse 46 that should be repeated in your mind. Thus it is written, and thus it is written that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, listen, it's not only written in the Old Testament that the Christ has to suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. It is written in the Old Testament that the forgive, repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed 
in all the world, beginning in Jerusalem, in the name of Jesus. Even that was prophesied in the Old Testament. And that's why when we get over to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, we, we read things like this. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Peter takes what had up to that point been only applied titles that had only been applied to the nation of Israel, and he looks at the New Testament church, the people of God, Christians, the body of Jesus Christ, and says, you are a chosen race, you're a royal priesthood, you're a holy nation, you're a people for his own possession, you're the new Israel, you're the true church of the living God, and here's your job, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his Marvelous light. Wouldn't you say one of the excellencies of our God includes his love and his mercy and grace given to us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? In fact, wouldn't you say that's the pinnacle of his goodness, his excellencies? This is talking about preaching the gospel. Isaiah 52, verse 7 and also verse 10. You'll, you'll know these these, these verses. How beautiful upon the mountains. Oh, back remember, 800 years before Jesus came. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Verse 10, the Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. You see, Jesus explain prophecy about the preaching of the gospel to the nations by us, his followers. He explained that to his disciples, and we see that in places like Isaiah 52. Before Jesus ever died for us, it was prophesied that you and I would know him and that we would preach him, we would proclaim him. I don't mean preach like I'm doing up here. I mean, I mean proclaim, tell other people. You're a preacher of the gospel. You're, 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 a, you're a witness to these things, even the resurrection of Jesus. Lastly this morning, notice with me in verses 48 and 49, Jesus exhorts his followers to preach the gospel in the power of his indwelling Spirit. Verse 48. You, he says to them, are witnesses of these things. Everything he, he just explained to them about himself in the Old Testament, the, the fact that all of that had been fulfilled in him, in his coming, in his living, in his dying, in his resurrection. He says, you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high by the way the promise of my father that he would send upon them it's the same thing as that's being described when he says until you're clothed with power from on high it's a reference to the holy spirit that was what the father had promised to the people of god in John 20, verse 21, in, his, in John's account of this, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. He said it twice over in John. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. There in the same room, same occasion, still there in the room on Sunday evening, Jesus says, As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. You are witnesses of these things, Luke writes, and behold, I'm sending you the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city till you're clothed with power from on high. You are going to be a proclaimer of the gospel, but you need the power of the indwelling Spirit to do it. So wait in the city till you're clothed with power from on high. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Luke records Jesus' words where he says to his disciples, but you will receive power... When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He said that sometime later, 40, 50 day, 40 to 50 days later, just before he lifted off and went to the Father. He said, you're going to be my witnesses. 
You'll start in Jerusalem. It'll spread out to Judea and Samaria, the surrounding areas, and it'll go. You'll go even to the ends of the earth. But wait in the city till you clothe the power. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. This, this task is not one we can accomplish on our own. Frank, we were talking about the Great Commission. You appreciate that encouragement. We can't do that on our own. People can't go give their lives to serve in some far-off, hard-to-live place without the power of the Holy Spirit. The truth of the matter is, you can't cross the street and effectively share the gospel with your neighbor except for the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And so he tells them, this is your job, and you're going to be given power for it. And that's exactly what we read in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, we have the account of when this power came. And so just listen fast, because I'm fixing to read real fast, but it's worth it. It's worth hearing When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. If I was one of the disciples, wouldn't you be wondering after Jesus said, wait till you're clothed with power? Like, like, what? what, what? How, How will I know? How will I be sure it's happened? He made sure. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, it happened, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, because it was Pentecost, remember. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. So the hearers were from all over the world, and they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not these all who are speaking Galileans, by the way, not known for being intellectuals, known for being fishermen? And how is it that we hear each one of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking. There's always those. They were, they're filled with new wine. They're drunk. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. Again, the Old Testament said this day would happen. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour my Spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved. Verse 36, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit, for the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone who calls, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Verse 41, so those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. The Old Testament had, had prophesied that, that repentance and the, for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in the name of Jesus. And it happened in Acts chapter 2. It happened on the day of Pentecost. By the way, have you you been tracking? You see see how this logic works? If God can raise the dead, he can do anything. Jesus can appear in a room without opening the door. No sweat. 
I don't have any trouble believing that. If I believe Jesus rose from the dead, then I have no trouble believing that. I have no trouble believing that a bunch of fishermen can suddenly be multilingual. By the way, there was a long list. Now, I don't know. I'd have to run the math. Maybe, the, maybe, maybe, maybe there was uh, exactly the amount of languages listed there in that passage per, for disciples. So maybe they only, got, they, they only got the knowledge of one language. But here's the bottom line. They just started praising the Lord and, and preaching the gospel like Peter did. But they did it in languages they didn't. They had, there's no way they knew. They didn't know those languages. I mean, people, people had come back to Jerusalem from a long way off. And these boys couldn't leave the Sea of Galilee because that's where they made their living. I have no problem believing that God can give someone the ability to speak another language and preach in another language if he wants to do that. And on that day, guess what? He done it. 3,000 got saved. <laughs> hey, you reckon the boys knew that they'd been clothed with power? They've been wondering all those days, how will we know? Well, they knew. Jesus exhorts his followers to preach the gospel in the power of his indwelling spirit. And that job's still the same for us. You are witnesses of the resurrection. The reality of Jesus' resurrection. Doesn't it do this? Doesn't it comfort you? That's, that's what it's supposed to do. The reality of Jesus' resurrection comforts us so that we trust him and obey his commission to proclaim the gospel in the power of his spirit. Maybe you're here today and you've not yet trusted the risen Christ as your Savior. You've not yet surrendered to him as Lord. You've not cried out to him like Thomas is, my Lord and my God, I give you everything I have. I trust you as my only hope and Savior. And I give you my life. You are now the boss of me. Maybe you've not yet done that. John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. John said of his gospel account specifically, but may I suggest to you it's true of this entire book. Now Jesus did many other signs, John says, in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. In other words, there's a whole lot more that happened that John didn't record. But these, what's in John chapter 1 through 21. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. This book was written as a whole so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, by trusting Him, you may have life, even everlasting life, in his name. By the way, somebody asked me the other day, why do we often give, if we, if we have to just give one book of the Bible to someone, and on a recent Central Asia uh, trip, why did we hand out copies in the native tongue of those to whom we gave them, copies of the Gospel of John? Because John testifies about the book, that he wrote the book, so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. It's tailored. It's structured. The whole gospel of John is structured so that people can see Jesus as the Son of God and believe in him. So by the way, if you ever need to give somebody something, but you can't give them a whole, find a copy of the, of the gospel of John. Don't tell Jim Leslie or the Gideons, but get a life book if you can get your hands on one, and I know where some might be. It's a copy of the gospel of John, and hand it to somebody. Because it was written that they might know. Get someone to sit down and read the Bible. Just get them started in Scripture. And God's Word will do the work. If you're here and you don't know Christ, I just challenge you, start in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Start there this afternoon. Because that book was written that by the time you get through with it in chapter 21, you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that you might have life in his name. That's Jesus' invitation to you. And if you're here this morning and you're already, you're already ready to cross the finish line, so to speak, you're ready to trust him, let me just exhort you from Scripture. Romans 10 verse 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord 
and believe in your heart. This is what it takes to, to be saved. Confess in your, with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God did what? That God did what? Raised Jesus from the dead. This is our faith. Quick aside, you can't be a Christian and not believe Jesus is alive. It's just not possible. But if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you what? Might be saved. It will be possible then for you to discuss that with, with, with the Father and maybe he'll make a deal. No, you will be saved. Because you've, you've taken God at his word. God said, this is my son with whom I will, I'm well pleased. This is the Lamb of God, John the Baptist would say, who takes away the sins of the world. This is the risen Lord. And you've said, God, I believe that. And God says, that's all it takes. For salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in the person and work of Christ alone. You see, we are witnesses of the resurrection. If you're here today and you don't know Christ, you're now a witness of the resurrection because you've heard all about it. And the reality of Jesus' resurrection comforts us so that we trust him and obey his commission to proclaim the gospel and the power of the Spirit. Church, if we're not proclaiming the gospel and the power of his Spirit, then we are not living as if the resurrection is true. Because if he's alive, it changes everything. And if you're here today, he wants you to know the comfort that you can have a living Savior. Won't you trust him?